As a city council member, you have a big say in land use decisions. In fact, you get to be the final vote on land use decisions. So when big developers come to your district, you have a great ability uh, to get the community resources um, from the developer, to extract those resources. So as a civil rights litigator, I have sat across the table from big corporate executives and I have advocated successfully on behalf of my clients at the most vulnerable times in their lives. And that prepares me well to go into the city council and sit across the table from a big real estate developer and tell them, if you wanna build in lower Manhattan, we need more schools. If you wanna build in lower Manhattan, we need more affordable housing units. And if you wanna build here, we need an environment where small businesses can thrive. Um, and as a city council member, I would oversee the uniform land use review process and one of the big changes that I would try to make um, is to create a master plan for Lower Manhattan so that we already map out ahead of time um, how many schools we need in each area, how many affordable housing units we need in each area. So a real estate developer who wants to come here knows from the beginning that if they're going to develop here, they need to include X number of units, X number of schools. Um, and as a civil rights litigator, I had that negotiating ability to get in there and advocate effectively for our community. We have a lot of large-scale development downtown and uh, when that happened, they have to think about building schools because it's going to be a lot more resident. And in the City Council, I have introduced legislation that's going to look at making sure that developers who are doing large-scale development, that they contribute uh, to school seats in the district but also in the city council, if the development coming in are not as of right, uh, that they have to go through a public process, that in those negotiations that we have to push for, making sure that either schools are built or supporting uh, school seats um, in the neighborhood so that we can meet the growing needs uh, of an increased population. Well, each year the City Council disperses, um, I guess, close to $50 million in discretionary funding that are expense and capital. I think that is, these kind of funding are very important in our district. And the way that we have um, done is that we have reached out to a lot of the organizations in our community, whether it's community-based organization, arts and cultural group, our local schools, libraries, uh, to see what their needs are and really encourage them to apply. And in my office, I have a budget director that spends a lot of time communicating with these groups to make sure they know what the processes are. And these kind of funding, especially on the expense side, for example, we get to support at a senior center to uh, add in classes for an exercise program or a jewelry making class or the senior course. And I have visited uh, seniors when they got together to perform because they were able to um, take advantage of a, a, a class that was, let's say, uh, conducted by the Church School of uh, Music and Arts. And people really um, enjoy those resources. We are also able to use expend money uh, to support local residents in our public housing project so that they can do family days or they can do a high school graduation day. So there are a lot of good programs that these discretionary funds support. And on the capital side, the discretionary funds help us support a lot of innovative programs like in Tribeca, we supported uh, the Bulgaris Garden um, to do their plaza program to increase public space um, in the neighborhood. 
We also are able to support schools to get a new gym floor or gym equipment, computer equipment like at PS150. Um, so there are a lot of innovative program and also needed resource that we can support with this discretionary capital dollars. So I think it's really an important program that will be very, it's very helpful in our community. One of the ideas that I'm very excited to implement in the City Council is participatory budgeting. And in participatory budgeting, the people in the district actually get to vote on how the council member's discretionary funding is spent in the district. I think that participatory budgeting is a wonderful way to engage the community in the democratic process and give uh, members of the district a voice. Um, now this innovative approach, participatory budgeting, has been implemented already by several progressive council members in the city. And I'm very excited about the prospect of bringing that to District 1. Additionally, um, I think that we need to reform um, the, the system for how discretionary funds are allocated between council members in the whole city to make sure that those funds are distributed equally to the different council members because I want to make sure that Council District 1 always receives its fair share. Board 1 is extremely effective. It's made up of community members who devote hours of time um, as volunteers in service of the community. Um, and they've done incredible work um, in terms of helping to uh, implement population studies so that we know how many more new schools to build, um, in terms of voicing the community's interests in uniform land use review processes in the district. So uh, I have the highest regard for Community Board 1, and as a council member, I'd be very excited to work with the Community Board. Um, as a council member who gets to appoint members of the board, my priority would be to appoint members who have a broad diversity of experience and who come from many different geographical areas within the district. I would also look for diversity in age. So those would be my priorities. I would also be very excited when elected to create uh, special groups that will discuss exactly this question so that I don't answer this question in a box, but I enlist current Committee Board 1 members, past Committee Board 1 members, the former Committee Board 1, Committee Board 1 chair, and we all sit together and address this question of criteria I should use when selecting the council, uh, selecting the community board members. Well, the city council representative uh, recommend half of the appointments to the community board. And in community board one, uh, this is one of the community board where half of the member uh, came from my recommendation. And it's really important to attract community residents and uh, business people from across the district. And that's something that I have done uh, in my term at the City Council, is to make sure that we have residents uh, from the local neighborhood, like we've gotten more uh, residents from uh, the seaport area, also business owner there, from the financial district uh, in Southbridge and IPN in Tribeca. And uh, so this way that we get the broadest representation of resident, business owner, stakeholder, from across the district. And we also um, encourage people to apply as a public member. And that is something that I have recommended to people who are interested to serve on the community board, is to get involved as a public member, serve on a committee, um, have some input and really get to know uh, the people on the board. And hopefully, if you're willing to continue to serve, then apply you know, as a regular member. And I actually have appointed um, people from the community who have served first as public member. So I still encourage people to do that.
When I'm reelected, one of the major goals will be trying to get another school built down here in Low Manhattan. We have so far convinced DOE that we need an extra thousand seats in Low Manhattan. So they have allocated um, the seats. Now we have to find the site. So hopefully in my next term that we can identify an appropriate site that can become the future uh, public school down here in District 1. We're still looking at 22 Reed Street because that was one of the buildings that um, the city did not sell off. So we, are, we have already asked the DOE uh, and SEA to do a full evaluation of the building to see whether we can retrofit that building uh, to turn it into another public school down here. I would make sure that Council District 1 is fully prepared for the next hurricane. We know that there will be another hurricane. So as a council member, I will be proactive. I will make sure that we change the building codes um, in buildings in Bowdy Park City South, um, in Tribeca, in the financial district, that will allow us to move the electrical equipment higher up so that when flooding occurs, buildings don't shut down and residents are not displaced. I would support the creation of removable storm walls in um, the financial district, Lower East Side and Chinatown. Um, I would also spearhead the creation of a core volunteer group so that when we are hit, we will have people that are out taking care of residents. Uh, and this would involve co coordinating different community emergency response teams in the district. And as someone who's already government relations director for the Bowdy Park City community, community emergency response team, I, I believe that that gives me uh, good experience uh, to do this. Uh, in addition, I would also make sure we're fully protected for the next hurricane at the legislative level. So I would be interested in drafting and passing legislation that makes sure that FEMA benefits for our district um, that are um, allotted by the federal government uh, are effectively trickle down to residents at the local level. We need to streamline that process for how FEMA relief comes down to residents to make sure all residents receive the benefits that they are entitled to. So I would pass legislation to streamline that process. Um, also legislatively, I would like to pass legislation that creates a system where we identify the most vulnerable residents in the district, uh, people with disabilities, uh, low income residents, the elderly, so that we know in advance who's gonna be most at risk when the next hurricane hits and that we will be able to contact these people ahead of time. Um, so in all of these ways, uh, I will be proactive and make sure at all levels that District 1 is fully prepared for the next hurricane. I have publicly um, reiterated over and over again that I do not believe that this independence pact have a place in our democratic process. And I have said that I am not beholden to anyone, only to the constituents that elected me. And this is really important that I have not taken any contribution for these so-called landlords or uh, what my opponent is keep saying, uh, the real estate. What I want to let the voter know is that I have earned the support of the most progressive members of our elected official, like Congressman Jerry Nadler, uh, Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez, who are supporting my re-election campaign, as well as a lot of progressive union from 1199, uh, DC 37, um, 32BJ, UFT, uh, Hotel Trades, all these progressive unions along with the Working Family Party are supporting my re-election effort. And I'm also part of the Progressive Caucus Alliance, helping working together with our union partners and the Working Family Party to support more progressive candidates uh, to be elected to the city council so that we can expand 
uh, the strength and the number of the Progressive Caucus, which I was one of the founding member. So my track record stands strong that I am strongly advocating for working family and middle income family and my track record speaks for itself. I think you need to look at my finance filings once again and what you will see and what I'm very proud of is grassroots contributions, small grassroots contributions from all across the district. So many artists in Soho who want a council member who will protect the neighborhood have, have um, contributed to my campaign. Um, over 30 restaurant workers in Chinatown um, gave me between 10 and $20 contributions because they said, Jennifer, we know you will stand up for affordable housing. We know you will stand up for a living wage. Um, and uh, I have contributions from all neighborhoods uh, of small amounts. And it is grassroots contributions that are fueling my campaign. Um, and what I think is troubling um, is that Council Member Chin is receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more, from an outside PAC called Jobs for New York, which is actually uh, funded by real estate moguls and real estate interests, including uh, many of the landlords downtown that have spoken forthrightly against affordable housing and have been at the forefront of displacing residents by driving up rents. Um, I find that very troubling and I call upon Council Member Chin to disavow the support of this multi-million dollar PAC that is trying to buy the council seat. Because it's my firm conviction that the council seat belongs in our hands. I am the best candidate for city council because I know how to fight for you. As a civil rights lawyer, I have been at that negotiating table with the big corporate executive on the other side. Um, and I've been able to represent my clients effectively and stand up for them. And as a council member, I will be able to get in there, sit at the negotiating table, sit across from that big real estate developer who wants to come into the neighborhood and extract the concessions our community needs. I stand on principle. And that principle is that as an elected representative, the people come first. I represent only them. I am accountable only to you, the voters. I am not accountable to big outside business interests. I am not accountable to big outside real estate interests, not to the mayor, not to the speaker of the city council. At the end of the day, I am here to represent only you, the people. And uh, in council members Chin's four years, we have not seen this. We have seen her representing real estate developers more than the people of Lower Manhattan. And that is why I had to step up and run for that position. I was very proud and honored uh, to be elected back in 2009 uh, to be the city council representative of District 1. This is a district where I grew up in, I raised my family, and I've lived and worked here for 50 years. I remember um, in the beginning of the year on January 9th when I was sitting in the city council and I looked up at the ceiling and to really reflect back that 50 years ago on that day I landed in an airport in Queens which is now the JFK airport um, a nine-year-old young girl who never in her wildest dream could imagine that 50 years later will be sitting in the city council representing her community and the neighborhood that she grew to love. I have a strong background in advocacy for affordable housing, for immigrant families, for working families, for close to 40 years. And in my first term of the city council, I brought that advocacy and that commitment to the city council. And the range of issues that I've worked on, that I have accomplished, that I fought for my community, from advocating you know, for 
Private Danny Chan, getting justice for him, bringing the community together to go down to North Carolina for the trial and to advocate for legislation in Washington that will help you know, soldiers across the country against bullying. Um, I was able to help a lot of fire victims uh, to be able to get temporary shelter and be able to move back to their own home organizing tenants to make sure that they fight for their rights. And in every development project that came through the city council that I worked on, especially at the Seward Park Urban Renewal Site, that after 45 years, we were able to pull together a community consensus and a plan that bring about 500 units of permanent affordable housing. Um, and the same thing with saving after school programs and daycare programs and our senior centers. I've worked in order to bring all the neighborhood of Lower Manhattan together. And I think in my next term, I will continue to build on that, to build on the activism and the commitment that all of us in District 1, no matter what neighborhood we come from, that we have commonality in terms of the issue that affects our daily life. And I really wanted to have the opportunity to continue to serve. So I hope that on September 10th that you will come out and cast your vote to support my reelection.